These days, the EU is often portrayed as a declining power, full of stuffy but ineffective bureaucrats, with neither the economic might of China nor the military might of the US. There is, however, one sense in which the EU is a true superpower. It's a regulatory superpower. The EU is unique in its ability to unilaterally transform global markets, be it through its ability to set the standards in competition policy, food safety, or the protection of data privacy. EU regulations affect the food we eat, the products we produce and consume, and even the air we breathe. So in today's video, we'll be looking at how the EU rules the world through regulation, otherwise known as the Brussels effect. Before we start, a bunch of our viewers didn't know that we actually have other YouTube channels. You can find much more news from us if you head over to TLDR UK, US and Global. Subscribe to the channels you're interested in, or just all of them, to get the most from TLDR and stay in the loop. They're linked below. So, first things first. Let's explain the term, the Brussels effect. It was first coined in 2012 by Professor Anu Bradford of Columbia Law School. The premise is that because the EU has one of the largest and wealthiest consumer markets in the world, Many international companies consequently want to do business with the EU single market and its member states. These companies conclude that it's in their interest to adopt EU regulations because they want to avoid the cost of complying with multiple different regulatory regimes in different places. EU rules are often seen as the gold standard. All the EU needs to do is regulate the single market. It's then the global companies and their market incentives that end up transplanting these EU regulations across the world. Professor Bradford's research concludes the EU regulations influence the everyday lives of individuals around the world in four key areas. Number one, market competition. Number two, the digital economy. Number three, consumer health. And number four, the environment. You might be wondering, what does this actually mean in real terms? Well, let's run through them one by one, starting with market competition. EU competition law was enacted in 1957 as part of the EU's founding treaties. Article 101 of the Treaties of the Functioning of the European Union expressly prohibits anti-competitive agreements between firms. Such prohibited agreements include, for example, price-fixing cartels between competing firms, or distribution agreements where suppliers dictate the prices for their distributors. Article 102 of the TFEU prohibits the abuse of a dominant position. Let's take the example of Google, which was fined three times in the space of three years by the EU. In 2017, the EU Commission fined the company $2.3 billion after concluding that the company manipulated its search results to favour its own comparison shopping service to the detriment of its rivals. In 2018, the European Commission fined Google $5 billion for breaching EU antitrust rules. Google designed a system whereby traffic on Android devices went straight to the Google search engine. The Commission's third case against Google was for $1.7 billion in 2019, due to the company's AdSense online advertising program. Google abused its market dominance by preventing its rivals from placing their search adverts on certain websites. In the end, Google had to face the fines and comply with EU competition law. The EU is an important market for many multinational companies, and they cannot afford to forego selling their products and services to the large number of relatively wealthy EU consumers. In addition to shaping the global marketplace through the extraterritorial enforcement of its own competition law, the EU has been remarkably successful in expanding its regulatory regime abroad. Today, over 130 jurisdictions have a domestic competition law, making competition law one of the most widespread forms of economic regulation around the world. 
A great majority of them have been drafted to closely resemble EU competition law. So that's how the EU influenced market competition around the world. Moving on to number two, the digital economy. In the EU, privacy is considered a fundamental right. The 2009 Lisbon Treaty elevated data protection as a fundamental right guaranteed by EU institutions. GDPR calls for lawfulness, fairness and transparency in processing data. It also limits the quantity and purpose for which data can be collected and requires that all the entities, whether private companies or government agencies collecting and processing data, ensure the integrity, security and accuracy of the data. Data can further be stored only for a limited period. In 2016, prompted by the entry into force of the EU GDPR, consumers across the EU were flooded with emails from numerous companies asking for their consent on the use of their personal data. Businesses around the world were forced to quickly adjust their data collection, storage and usage practices in response to the EU's regulation. If you look at the privacy policies of US companies such as Google, Apple, Facebook or Microsoft, they are all following the EU GDPR not only when they are operating in the EU, but also across the world. The EU is an important market for many of these data-driven businesses. Facebook has 250 million users in Europe, contributing to 25% of Facebook's global revenue. Google's share of the search market engine is over 90% in most EU member states, which exceeds its 67-75% to 75 market share in the United States. Abandoning the EU market is not even remotely a commercially viable option for them. It would be burdensome for these digital companies to circumvent the GDPR by moving their data processing activities outside the EU. And it's not just in digital space the EU are trying to protect its citizens. They've also influenced global regulation on consumer health. Let's take the example of cocoa beans. Cameroon is the world's largest cocoa grower. Cocoa beans, butter and paste accounted for over 15% of the nation's exports, second only to petroleum as a proportion of exports. To preserve the company's export opportunities, Cameroonian officials have undertaken several measures to comply with the EU's regulatory demands, including carrying out tests, inspections and education campaigns to ensure the industry's compliance with the EU rules. Regardless of these efforts, in 2013 the EU rejected a 2,000 tonne consignment of cocoa beans from Cameroon due to the presence of high levels of harmful chemicals. This led Cameroonian authorities to crack down on substandard cocoa production practices and provide assistance to help the industry meet EU standards. The government provided new or refurbished ovens for drying cocoa and confiscated poorly dried beans. In essence, because the EU market was so important for Cameroon's economy, its government made sure its companies were able to adjust their business practices to EU regulations. And widening their scope beyond protecting people, the EU has a major influence on environmental protection regulations. Let's use the example of animal welfare. Japanese cosmetic firms are among those that have adjusted their global manufacturing to conform to EU animal welfare regulations. Shizido, Japan's largest cosmetic manufacturer, halted animal testing in 2013 to abide by the EU ban on the sale of animal tested cosmetics. Several other Japanese cosmetics companies such as Cowcorp and Cozcorp followed suit. These companies are now increasingly using cultured human cells to replace animal testing on products. The manufacturers are under no legal obligation to do so in Japan, but they still refrain from animal testing as it would cost them revenue from abroad. Some manufacturers are even demanding that their suppliers of ingredients promise not to conduct tests on animals. 
So it's fair to say that the EU is a regulatory superpower that shapes the world's economy, but without even most people noticing. Few people realise that EU standards determine the privacy policies of big American tech companies to what kind of pesticides cocoa farmers in Cameroon can use. If you enjoyed this video, then be sure to subscribe to TLDR EU. Remember, you can get a whole load more from TLDR by making sure you're subscribed to our other channels too. TLDR Daily, UK, Global and US. Thanks for your support.